So in the past two episodes, we've talked about what functions are and how we can get some very useful functions by importing them through packages online. But there are definitely going to be moments in your programming journey when you're going to want to make your own functions, either because you can't find one online to suit your needs, or you want to make one specific to your programming code. Luckily, making your own functions is extremely simple. There are just some basic rules that I want to cover today. Now while we've previously talked about how to make certain functions as examples in previous videos, they were extremely abstract and didn't go into depth into what is actually needed for a function to operate. In today's episode, we're going to be covering a skeletal system of everything that needs to be included in a function in order for it to work. Now think back to our four different types of functions that we talked about previously. Void and return functions that both do and do not take in arguments. Well today we're going to be talking about each individually and how to approach creating them, starting with the most basic of the bunch, one which takes in no arguments and returns no values. For this type of function, all you need to do is define the name and add parentheses. So for example, to make a function called print something, all we need to do is name the function and then add a set of open and close parentheses after, which will make sense shortly. Also, something really quick I want to note here is that variable naming conventions also translate over to function names. So you can't have two word functions and you can't use special characters like periods or commas when naming your functions. Generally, you're going to want to follow the camel case style which we talked about in the variables video. After you've determined your function name, each language differs on how you tell the computer that it's a function. In Java, you define whether the function is public or private, which is something you don't really need to know about unless you're going to become more invested in Java, but it basically determines which parts of code can use the functions and which cannot. Then you determine which type of function it is, so in this case, it won't be returning any variables, so we'll just put void, and then you put your function name with a set of parentheses after it, like so. Now that's just for Java. Python, on the other hand, all you do is put def, short for define, and then the function name with a set of parentheses. So as you can see, each language is going to be different, but the main thing we want to remember is to always add parentheses, which may seem odd now, but will come into play later. From there, we just type what we want our function to do, close off the loop, and we're done. Moving on to the next type of function, creating a void function that takes in arguments. Now this process is going to seem very similar to the previous, except for one small adjustment. Remember the parentheses that I mentioned like 30 seconds ago? Well this is actually where we place the arguments we want to pass into our function. We put any variables we want the user to give to the function into these parentheses, and then when we call that specific function, it will have to have those types of variables pass into it. For example, let's make a function that takes in two numbers and prints out the product of those numbers. When defining the function, you would define which type of variable you want to pass in, in this case an integer, and then a name for that variable. This name is just so that it can be referenced throughout the function easily. For this example, let's just call it number one. Then, if we want to add another argument, we simply add a comma in between the two, and we can make another variable, number two, to hold the second number. We could do this for however many variables we want to pass into the function, but for now, let's just close off the parentheses and just print out the product of number one and number two. Now, when we want to call the multiply numbers function, we just have to make sure that we are putting two numbers in as arguments. In this case, the number 5 becomes number 1, and the number 8 becomes number 2. The two numbers are multiplied together, and as soon as their code runs, the number 40 is printed to the console. It's important to note that you can also mix and match variables when making arguments. So you can have some function which takes in a car, integer, two strings, and an array, all within one function, which is pretty neat in my opinion. The last thing I want to mention is that when you call a function, you have to follow the variables you defined when making the function. So for our multiply numbers function, you couldn't put a string and then an int. It has to be two integers, just like you defined with the function. So now that we've gone over how to make functions that don't return variables, we have to cover those that do, and we'll start with ones that don't take in arguments. Now the main difference between defining functions that return variables and defining ones that do not is that in some cases you have to specify that you want this function to return an integer variable. This is most commonly used in Java, where you would simply replace void with int to tell the computer that you want this function to give an integer back to you. The most important thing to remember about making functions that return variables is that no matter what path your code takes, it has to return a variable. But what does this mean? Well, let's say you had some string function in a game, and inside of it there was an if statement, where if the player score was above a 10, 
you returned a congratulatory message. Well, if the player score was less than 10, you don't have something prepared to return to the user, and so the function is going to throw an error at you. You have to have all your paths covered, which may seem like a simple task, but if you're making a function with a switch statement in it containing high amounts of cases, this can get out of hand quickly and sometimes you can just forget. Something I like to do is just put a return statement at the bottom of the function with a string or integer so unique that I'm always able to tell whether or not the code is running properly and can easily fix it. The main point I'm trying to get across, however, is always cover your exits and always have a return statement prepared for any case that the user may throw at you. Another small thing to note is that you can't return one type of variable if you already define the function to return another type. For example, you couldn't return a string in an integer function or vice versa. The final type of function is one that returns variables and also takes in arguments. And for these, you just combine what we learned from the previous cases. Assign your arguments between the parentheses, make sure you have defined what you want to return, and ensure that you are always returning something. This concludes our three-parter on functions. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing and leaving a like. If you haven't seen the rest of the videos in the series, check out the playlist linked to the right. Thanks for watching.